We are live. Welcome to 2008's Vantage Point Review and Thoughts film. Other than the fact that there is at least one good guy character in this movie that's a good father, there is no significance to the fact that I put this video out so close to Father's Day. Nor for Pride Month, but arguably there will be something more appropriate to Pride Month next week. I realize this video is long, but if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. See its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies I watch, so I'm going to keep, speak faster so my back feels better. Also, you might be able to hear there are three fans in this room set to the highest speed each because it has gotten hot again. The summer has started. Now, during the review section of this video, if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn you before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so that you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. Most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I got this movie on sale, so anything negative to say in this video is not out of bitterness. Also, I feel like the movie wasted my time, nobody forced me to watch it or make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone for from making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I send this are for criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. A few days ago, I rewatched Street Kings. It's not that this movie and that are hugely similar, but I have to go with something. I didn't want to rewatch the Bourne trilogy since I'll be rewatching that soon for Black Widow anyway. So, since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, if it's possible, I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, I have watched this somewhere between three and five times, and I first saw it in 2010. And let's see, this, this is one of those movies that I've owned for a really long time. First time I watched it was a number of years ago, and have watched it mm, several times over the years and really made a strong impression on me. I've been wanting to talk about it on camera for a while, and the most recent viewing was right before I started recording this video, so that it would be fresh in my mind. Now, plot. In Salamanca, Spain, there's a gathering of some 150 world leaders for an international anti-terrorism summit. It's 12 noon. The president of America walks up to the podium. He's about to give a public speech there, and suddenly he's shot. Who did it and why? Now, this is an action crime drama from 2008, and it was directed by Pete Travis, perhaps best known for directing 2012 Dread, which is an excellent movie. And I will say that one is definitely better than this, but I do still like this movie a lot. And it's based off a script by Barry L. Levy, who has barely written anything else, much less anything that people know. And the concept is essentially Akira Kurosawa's Rashomon, if it were an action movie, about a post-9-11 terrorist attack. If you don't think that sounds amazing, I do not know how to talk to you. Don't get me wrong, if you don't like the movie, that's fine. I'm not saying it's for everyone. There might even be a few criticisms that I agree with, I'll get to in this video. But you have to admit, at least in theory, that's awesome. Now, the thing that some of us love and other people hate, and some just kind of begrudgingly accept, is that this movie shows these, you know, it's, it's the same 23 minutes from, you know, that, that it shows no... Uh, numerous times, I'll go with numerous times, from different vantage points. And the it's it's not actually that we see the, the twenty three minutes are not real time, despite the numerous comparisons to twenty four, which are are fair. I haven't watched a lot of twenty four, but there's definitely a, a lot of resemblance. But yeah, the the 
you know, for every time it's showed the 23 minutes, it will jump back by 23 minutes, switch to the perspective of someone whose perspective we haven't seen until then. The new character may have appeared in other people's perspective, may have even been an important character, but we haven't seen their perspective until then. I do think that if there had been one more perspective, it would have been too many, but a lot of great movies are just at the edge of being too long. You know, I'm not saying this movie is as good as The Dark Knight, but that movie is, you know, like, if, if The Dark Knight was five minutes longer, it would be too much. I'm not saying the, the movies are the same quality. I'm just pointing out that it's a bad argument to say that a movie is bad for almost being too long. If you think it's too long, that's bad for sure. But almost too long, that can be a great thing. I think it's a great thing. That I'm, I'm really glad that they didn't push it any further. And something that definitely divides audiences is that at the end of a 23-minute segment, there will be a scene of tension and or a character realizes something important, sees something important, another puzzle piece, but it will cut to the next perspective before the tension is resolved, before we see the new puzzle piece reveal, leaving us on a cliffhanger, something... You know, it's, it's somewhat like Lost, the TV show would do. I would argue that it always goes to something interesting, even though, you know, it, it'll be to the end of the next vantage point before we see the resolution of the cliffhanger. And sometimes it's, sometimes it's more than one vantage point that passes before the cliffhanger is resolved. But there's always development of plot, and I know not everybody agrees with me on this, but there's also always development of character and development of themes, each perspective, and some of the perspectives are just non-stop action. And every single one of them reveals that something we saw before wasn't exactly what we thought it was. You know, I... And, and let's see, the... Yeah, I, f I feel like that's something that some of the reviewers who say that this doesn't understand that Rashomon was specifically about subjective perspectives rather than objective truth. Once again, don't get me wrong, this movie is not Rashomon. It is nowhere near as good, you know. <laughs> saying, that some, saying that a movie is not on the level of an Akira Kurosawa movie, come on, man, let's not, that's, that's an, an impossible standard. You know, this, but this movie does, yeah, this movie is about subjective perspectives. Not to the same extent and not quite with the same effect as Rashomon. You know, if you haven't watched Rashomon, watch Rashomon. It's an excellent movie. And, and if you're someone who's like, who has low, low, low threshold for like, you know, oh, it's like an old movie. It's a foreign language. It's like black and white. It's only 90 minutes. You'll you'll get through it fine. But yeah, this is a movie that makes you appreciate that a lot of people can think they saw something really conclusive, but they don't have all the information. You come to really question how much you can believe eyewitness testimony, which is sadly something in real life trusted entirely too much. It's important to realize that the human brain did not evolve to perfectly perceive every minute detail as much as to be able to quickly pick up signs of potential danger. Now, in one of the featurettes, uh, the, one of the DVD, and I think it's also on the Blu-ray featurettes, an inside perspective, the director, Petrata, says, we try to make every telling of the story feel and look different depending on who's telling it. And... You know, the, the, yeah, they also talk about, you know, how, how, let's see. yeah, and, and, you know, figure out the, the camera position, you know, yeah, you use the camera position to indicate whose story, whose perspective are we seeing, and, some people really find it frustrating that there are some, for some of the vantage points, there are discrepancies. I don't think this is a mistake. I think it is, it's meant to convey, and I think it, the movie does a good job of it, because 
because of how short some of these are, you never, you know, when you sit and watch it, you don't forget what's happened, which is also something that, uh, you know, some people feel that it's repetitive. I completely disagree. It's oh, there's always something new and interesting. You know, apparently, like a bunch of people had the experience that they watched it in theaters, and people would boo or laugh when the movie would re rewind. I had basically the opposite reaction. Every time the, the movie would rewind, and once again, keeping in mind, I've watched this movie at least three times. So this it's not this is not the first impression I'm talking about. You know, you can watch it multiple times and still like get a rush when, when it rewinds and it goes to a different perspective and you realize that you thought you saw one thing and in reality you saw something completely different. And I, yeah, I think they did an incredible job on it. Now, considering the 9-11 included all of us seeing the planes hit the towers, you know, for, for like, I, I don't know exactly how long the, the news coverage kept going on, but like, it just showed the towers. You know, first, first we saw the, the first plane hit, and then later we saw the second plane hit. And the camera just stayed on the, the you know, for, for I, th I think, was it Richard Coughlin who pointed out that what what do we really gain by that? It's not, we, none of us can do anything about it, you know, but it's just the, you know, the news media think, well, you have to show it. That's the, you know, anyway, even after, even if you didn't see it live, it would get shown over and over and over once again, without us being able to do anything about it, I can't help but wonder if this movie is trying to achieve some of that same energy because it does show the president getting shot, and I don't, I'm not going to give away exactly what else, but it's not the only, it's not the only thing that happens, the only dramatic thing that happens, and we, yeah, we see it over and over. You know, honestly, whether this is a good movie or a bad movie, it's much like the flavor of Soylent Cola. It varies from person to person. Now the let's see, so so yeah, you know, thematically, post nine eleven, you know, it goes into post nine eleven anxieties about terrorism, especially focusing on the idea of being an important witness and getting, you know, your your first hand witness account to the right people in time. And yeah, so I don't know if there's another movie that's quite like this. It is hard to deny that you can get a very similar effect to this by binging episodes of a post-9-11 American action TV show based on fighting terrorism. And yeah, you know, I've, I haven't watched very much 24 for reasons I don't think I'll be going into in this video, but from what little I've seen, it does, there's, there's definitely some of that going on and, you know, without a trace, NCIS, yeah. And sometimes scenes are shown in real time, like 24. As frequently it will be when something, like, once, once something tense or suspenseful is happening. Yeah, the, the, the movie might stay with the same character, stay in the same event for a while where, you know, the the yeah rather the the yeah I suppose I've said what it, now I've seen some compare this to the Bourne trilogy which I've watched a number of times I love those three movies I'm really glad they only ever made three I'm sure if they made a fourth and fifth one they would suck as far as Rashomon and something else goes I love the movie Hoodwinked. And, you know, there are definitely some of Quentin Tarantino's movies that have been compared to Rashomon, and they're, yeah, I love almost all of Tarantino's movies. Now, I think it was very smart of this movie to start with the perspective of the news cameras, giving us a good overview of the main events, instead of plunging us into a very subjective perspective right away, since it does head for those afterwards. And I've seen some say that it could do more to criticize the, the media. It's, it's sort of, it's, it's a movie that will bring up important themes, but not always really follow through on them. It doesn't always have something to say. It just kind of wants credit 
for for knowing that this is a, a theme that people care about. And that is obviously frustrating, but I don't know. I suppose I'm giving it credit. I, th I think it's better than not bringing it up at all. And I know some people feel that you shouldn't bring it up at all if you're not going to do something with it. But So this movie keeps rewinding, as, rewinding and showing us a man getting shot. Alfred Hitchcock used to say that it was more exciting to know that an explosion was about to, ex to occur than to just show an explosion. I'm not 100% certain if this is a movie that he would have liked or loathed. Now, so I'm going to go ahead and quote, I believe this is a user review from Metacritic. This guy gave this 7 out of 10, The Godfather Son is his name. He says that, you know, if there's something to complain about, it's that the movie's vantage point gimmick serves no real purpose. It's there because the script is too lazy to weave all its characters together into one narrative, not because they thought of some unique and interesting way to tell the story. It works, but Vantage Point would work just as well, told traditionally with maybe, maybe even better. I, I disagree, but I respect that point of view. For, for sure, the, a number of people feel that way about the movie. And yeah, you know, if you haven't watched this movie and you don't know anything about the critical reception, a number of people did, in fact, you know, think that, that it doesn't really, I personally think that it's, it was the exact right way to, to tell it, but, you know, that, certainly I can understand, I think, hypothetically, if this, instead of a 90-minute movie, almost 90-minute movie, if instead it had actually been, actually, I think, 80 without, 80 minutes without any credits, if it had been, like, Let's see. I mean, I guess. I yeah, it wouldn't be quite the same if it was just two episodes of a. No, actually, yeah, never mind. I think if this movie had been two episodes of, I don't know. Let's go with twenty-four. And every time it reaches an ad break, you know, I I'm not certain how much twenty-four did this, but certainly stuff like without a trace, you know. Right before an ad break, they'll go to something really dramatic, and then they'll go to ad break hoping you'll stay through the ad break. If every ad break was one of these cliffhangers that are at the end of Vantage Point in this movie, and then when it comes back from ad break, it goes to a new Vantage Point, I think that might have been, it might have been more well received. But that's not really, you know, there are sadly, there are a lot of American movies that should have been a few episodes of a TV show or that that kind of thing and you know some producer was like I'm not gonna make us money we're not gonna make us much money if we just sell the, you know tailor the script to be a TV show episode and, and sell it no no we're gonna make a movie out of this we're gonna get several million dollars to put behind this and critics will point out that it should have been a, you know one or more episodes of a TV show, and I'll be too busy banking to hear them. Now, and honestly, if you, the viewer, know a movie that's like a spiritual success, you, the viewer of this video right now, if you know a movie that's like a spiritual successor, not a sequel, please, not a sequel, to this, then please let me know. I'd be very interested in watching it. I'm not sure, yeah, you know, I, I, I don't really know of another movie that's like this, I mean, I guess Lost, the TV show, did do some episodes that had a similar thing to this. And I, I've heard that there are games that are similar to this in concept. Uh, what was it called again? Something, something, Oprah Din, the last, the, the last voyage of the Oprah Din, maybe something like that. I, I think I might like to play that game. It looks, it looks really cool. And, and that is actually, yes, if this is, if this should have been anything other than a movie, I think a game might have been one of the best ways to, to do it. Yeah, you know, you, you, you control different characters in the different vantage points, but each of them controls more or less the same, so you can fairly quickly get back into the gameplay. 
but I do think the movie was worth making, and I'm going to try not to be too much of an apologist for this movie. I, I'm not interested in being an apologist, but I do think that some of the criticism that this movie got was unfair, and so I'm going to try to stand up for it on some of the aspects. And now, so whether or not this is plot-driven or character-driven, that is a bit difficult to say because technically, you know, I guess it's it's kind of a mix. I suppose, actually, yes, it depends on the vantage point. Some of the time, things are happening and we don't know who's doing them and we don't know why. Then other vantage points, you know, yeah, there there is at least one vantage point in this movie that is actually the vantage point of at least one of the people who's involved in this terrorist attack. And, yeah, for, for those, I, I would say character-driven is, yeah, a, a decent, yeah. I, I think they made the, the right choice. I really like that for a lot of the, the, the and, you know, yeah, also real quick, some would say that there's that it's style over substance. For sure, there's a lot of focus on style. I think the movie definitely does want to tap into the the anxiety by using some vantage points of people who have no idea what's going on. They're just reacting to it the way that we, the audience, are. And there are like shots and and sequences that are very exploitative of, like, 9-11 anxieties. There's this, uh, yeah, there's, like, shots of, of, like, chaos and civilians have, you know, are, are in danger and just, yeah. Now, the IMDb More Like This list compares this to the following movies that I myself have seen. It, you know, it compares it to, like, 12 different movies, but these are the ones I've seen. Phone Booth, which I give an 8 out of 10. Flight Plan, 7. SWAT, which I also give a 7. And yeah, so Phone Booth and Flight Plan, you know, I mean, other than obviously, I'm almost certain Phone Booth also has Chris Whittaker, so that's probably at least part of it. But yeah, Phone Booth and Flight Plan are similar to this movie in that there's a mystery and the fact that the characters are in this one specific location, you know, the, the, the plaza and near the plaza of Salamanca, Spain. And, yeah, SWAT, ensemble cast, action movie. And, you know, you, I, I would also compare, and as others have, com you know, you can compare this movie to In the Line of Fire, which I also gave a seven. Basically, Dennis Quaid's character in this, Thomas Barnes, is a Secret Service agent who took a bullet for the president, and now the president is being attacked again. So, yeah. And, no, Dennis Quaid is no Clint Eastwood. That's not... And, and I'm almost certain that's... That movie has, like, John Malkovich as the villain. The, the, I'm not going to give away who plays the villain in this. They're not as compelling as, you know, John Malkovich... He's, he's comp I, I don't think I've ever seen him play something badly, but he's he's incredibly compelling as villains, you know, in The Line of Fire, Con Air, yeah. And, yeah, so the, the you know, I gave Rashomon a 10 out of 10, and, yeah, you know, the, the comparison there is the different subjective accounts of the same events, and this has also been compared to Crash, which, you know, both have an ensemble cast and their stories affect each other. And yeah, so there there's definitely some comparisons to be made between this and Lucky Number Slevin. The only way for me to go into those is to spoil both. So until you see me lower my index finger, I am spoiling both Vantage Point and Lucky Number Slevin. Both movies basically cheat. We're not given enough information to be able to figure out the twists on our own because the filmmakers really badly wanted to be able to pull off twists that no one could get before the reveal. And no more spoilers 
for not for this movie, not for what can I tell. And the kingdom, which I give seven out of ten, bears resemblance to this in that it's Hollywood trying to communicate that not every Middle Eastern person a white person sees is a terrorist. And neither movie completely flawlessly pull off that well meaning message, but then, you know, yeah. I, I did a video on that. I, I forget exactly when, but weeks ago. And, yeah, you know, personally my favorite movie of the, you know, as, as far as, you know, Phone Booth, Flight Plan, SWAT, and this, this is my favorite of them. Now, but, you know, to be fair, I will admit, it has been years since I watched Phone Booth and Flight Plan, and Flight Plan I only watched once. I'm pretty sure I've watched Phone Booth at least two or three times. No, watched by myself, showed it to someone I knew would like it, yeah. Now... So... The, I, I would definitely say that, you know, for, for this movie, the, the screenwriter and director have something to prove. You know, this is their first big shot. And they they want to nail it. They don't want to botch it. One chance, one shot, one opportunity. And I would say largely they get it right. But I'm not gonna pretend. You you can kind of tell. You know, it's it's no nobody nobody does an incredible job. The very first time. If if you can think of a director where you're like, no no no, the first movie they made was amazing. No, no, no. The first movie they released was amazing. Nobody's very first movie is amazing. Stanley Kubrick himself wanted every copy. I think, I think the movie was called Paths of Glory. After release, he hated the movie so much that he wanted every copy of it destroyed. He wanted no one to see the movie. Stanley Kubrick. Now, I realize the man was a perfectionist, but he was also one of the best directors, so... And... The reason that I decided to review this, you know, a lot of the time, gimmicks lead to movies that are overall not particularly good. I would argue here the gimmick really works, and, you know, the reason I bought it was the, the gimmick sounded appealing, and... Yeah, I was very happy with the movie. Now, so yes, this, yeah, the, the writing by Barry L. Levy, he, yeah, so after yeah, his, his first nine writing credits total less than the Writers Guild of America minimum of around $21,000. Quoting him, I was so tired of writing what other people wanted me to write. You know what? I'm going to tell the story. And, it, yeah, Levy said about writing his breakthrough screenplay vantage point. His inspiration for the spec script, which deals with the attempted assassination of an American president from multiple perspectives, came from the controversial JFK assassination. The question I asked myself was, if there had been someone on the grassy knoll when John F JFK was shot, what would that story be? How would it break down? And, yeah. And, and like, Forrest Whitaker's character, Howard, is essentially Sapruder. Now... Apparently, one of the movies that Barry L. Levy wrote is called The Wolves of Wall Street, and it's literally about werewolves who work on Wall Street. That sounds like the worst movie ever made, and I need to watch it right now. Now, some people have pointed out that it doesn't make sense that the Spanish set event is controlled by the local mayor instead of the country's president. I'm almost certain they did this so that the audience would focus on American characters instead of the Spanish president, since why would people care about the local mayor 
when the American president is also part of it. Which is pretty funny for a movie where one of the bad guys says that the beauty of American arrogance is that they can't imagine a world where they're not a step ahead. And... Yeah. Spoiler for, for this movie. I think that might actually be why the movie never really gives a specific reason for why the terrorists are doing what they're doing. There's just this vague hint of revenge and nationalism. And I think that's how a lot of Americans feel about 9-11. They don't understand how much the U.S. military provoked people in the Middle East. And a lot of Americans aren't willing to accept any criticism of the American military anyway. Once again, I'm obviously not saying that the U.S. deserved 9-11, but it didn't come out of nowhere. It was a reaction. But a lot of American mainstream media didn't cover it like that. No more spoilers for the time being. And for sure, some of the subplots are very soap opera, and some audiences will dislike at least some of them. Personally, I love all of them. Now... Since the movie features, you know, the, the, this assassination attempt, I'm, I'm not going to give away whether it's successful or not, but you see the, the president shot, you know, you, you, may, you don't know that in the very first vantage point if you go into the movie blind, but the very next vantage point, you know that what you're seeing is, you know, it's, it's a different perspective. The movie makes that very clear. It's a different perspective, but it's the same events. So you're watching the movie trying to figure out who will hurt, will hurt. Who will kill Bill? And after the deed is done, who shot us the pubs? Wait, is there a chance... Could Dr. Phil kill Bill? Honestly, I wouldn't completely rule that out. That man is such garbage. And if you don't already know why, watch the videos by Big Joel and CC Marie where they talk about him. I'm kidding, I don't think he's actually a killer. But he is garbage. Now, in the DVD special feature called Plotting and Assassination, the director talks about, you know, it's, it's the, it's about the, the movie is about the domino effect. A lot of different people doing different things, not realizing that they impact on each other. And, you know, since, since so many things in the movie affect each other, if you change one thing, you have to change everything in, in the script. So, the, you know, and they compare that to the butterfly effect. And... I'm, let's, yeah, and, and, I, you know, I, I would say the, the movie doesn't revolutionize film, but it is a worthwhile entry to, you know, the, the, yeah, in, into the genre. As far as plot twists go, I should note that some people disagree with me on the following. In either direction. Some people were not able to follow the plot twist, others felt they were too easy to figure out. But in my opinion, the movie handles plot twists really well. There are not too many. It does come close. Again, one more twist, it would have been too many. I would argue there's there aren't very many of the twists. I maybe one or two of them are uh, not that good. I, I would say the, the worst of them are just decent. They're not terrible. And I think maybe at least one of them is a, you know, you can figure out before you, you see the, the twist. If on the very first viewing, it can, like, if you, if you don't pay close attention, it can be difficult to keep up with the twists. But, yeah. Now... And, and, you know, if, if after watching it, if you're, if there's some things you're not 100% certain about, you know, the Wikipedia plot summary is very detailed. It is clearly written by people who have watched the movie many times and are passionate about it. I wanted to make sure that there was as much information there as possible. And, yeah, it, it's, it, it clears up anything you might use. Yeah. Now... And, you know, I would also say the, you know, the movie rewards viewers who pay close attention. Now, the direction is quite focused. And, 
yeah, the, I'm afraid the only other thing I've seen by the Travis is Dread from 2012, which, once again, I give an 8 out of 10. Actually, yeah, I'm not sure he has directed all that many other movies. Now, but, you know, like, it didn't, like, destroy his career or something, so that's something at least. I would definitely say that he understood how, you know, how to make it work. And so the the very start of the movie, the the yeah, I, I, I would argue the first real shot of the movie, like they're at, at the, the very opening has these brief hazy like you can kind of tell, okay, that's like that's a sniper, right you know, a, a sniper there to protect the prisoner. You know, but the first real shot of the movie is an establishing shot of the plaza of... It, cer it certainly is of Salamanca, Spain. I think it is of the plaza. And then the camera goes to the speech, which, you know, which will start very soon. And, yeah, the, the opening of the movie does a really good job. It, it, right, you know, right away it sets up the coalition. It sets up that not everyone there loves America. The tense mood of a, ch a chunk of the crowd. You know, we feel like something bad might happen, and it really, like, if you if you want a, a decent test of, like, how important an opening can be, try to watch, you know, try to, instead of watching the movie from the, the very start, watch maybe four or five minutes into the movie and see how much of an impact it makes to miss that brief opening, which at the time, like, if you go into this blind, you, you might not, you probably wouldn't guess that it starts, that, that it hits, like, it goes from zero to a hundred in, like, no time, you know, it, it, it will, it, it starts much sooner than a lot of, you know, it gets much more dramatic, much quicker than a lot of movies. And that is, of course, also part of why it then needs to rewind, because it can't stay at that level throughout without switching vantage point. Now, the, the opening titles uses camera angles that make you think of surveillance cameras to set up as a major theme, that this is about how much you see from certain angles. Now, the ending, I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but the ending fits with what came before. I'm personally very happy with how the movie ends. It doesn't use Deus Ex Machina. It doesn't use any other convenient writing. I should say, I'm aware some people agree, disagree with that. Some people disagree with me on that. Some people think that the ending is very conveniently written and yeah the ending does a really great job at wrapping up everything now yeah so the yeah the the ending titles you know, the, the, yeah, the, the ending titles kind of, yeah, I should not give away exactly. The ending titles really fit the mood that the movie leaves you in. That's what I'll go with. Now, if you ask me and the people I've shown this movie to, which I think amounts to maybe half a dozen, no. This movie, you know, you never lose interest in this movie while watching it. But a number of people have found that they lose interest. I think if the gimmick really rubs you the wrong way, you might lose interest. You, you might feel like the movie is constantly, you know, ah, what's a good word? It's, it's always promising but never delivering. And... Obviously, that gets frustrating. That's just, that's never been the way I felt about the movie. Now, 
the movie uses the changing perspectives quite well. It does the Groundhog Day thing where early on certain things are established and then later on the movie expects you to remember everything that we learned along the way. So in some of the last perspectives, a lot happens and a lot of things that have been set up early on are resolved without you really being reminded of what was, you know, what, what took place earlier again. But yeah, I... Some people have found that it was too much. Some people said they were confused. Some people said that they felt like the, you know, the movie was taking forever to get to where they felt it was obvious that it was going to get to. You know, what what can I say? I'm, I'm, um, go, go Lelocks middle, middle porridge on, on this. Now, I would say the, the cast understood what, you know, what, what, how, how to make their character work. Now, the, I will say that the, yeah, about care, about the characters, for some of them, the, like, we, we get a strong impression of them from right away, and then the rest of the movie kind of just mainly goes off this strong first impression. You know, we, we don't... Whether or not they're compelling characters, I think depends on how much you're willing to go along with, like, kind of soap opera. Again, if this were longer, if this if this was part one of a trilogy, I'd probably be like, I'm, I'm, that's, no. This, you know, because it's one movie of 80 minutes, it's fine, you know, but... If, if it went on for much longer, the soap opera elements would get to be too, just too much. But, yeah, you know, soap opera, as a, as a, yeah, just briefly, part of the point of a soap opera is that you can, you can start watching from the very start, or you can jump in very late. Like, if, if you don't have a chance to watch it from the start, you can jump in very late. And, like, the first time a, a, a subplot will show up in an episode, like, a, a lot of... It's not that I've watched very much soap opera, but I, I know a bit about it. I have watched them. But, yeah, the first scene that's about a specific subplot, the characters will literally say what the subplot is about. You know, and, like, if you've seen, like, parodies of soap opera where, like, you know, there's a, there's the Dinosaur Office one where, you know, the, the, let's see, I thought you were your brother, I am, I should have pushed your brother into that volcano, maybe you did, you know, it's, it's these completely ridiculous, like, nobody talks in real life the way they do in a soap opera. But for soap operas, it works. And I think it was very intentional that here, like, some of these people, they're only the, the main character of their own vantage point. They don't have that much screen time. If the movie doesn't very quickly establish who they are, then nothing is going to be able to happen in their vantage point. Like, if, if you compare the way this movie and soap operas introduce characters and subplots and such, to, like, a big movie with, like, only one major character. Like, yeah, you know, why not Jason Bourne? Like, the, the, the character of Jason... Oh, okay, so, to be fair, the very, very introduction of Jason Bourne in, in the first of the movies is very quick. You, you very quickly get a sense of, but then, like, over the course of the movie, you know, he's not the same person at the end of the first movie, that he was at the start of the first movie, and because that movie doesn't have, you know, I'm not going to give the exact number, but a bunch of main characters, it can focus on just, you know, the, the few that it has, but this movie just, it, it wouldn't be able to do that. And the, let's see.
some of them, some of these actors have to do, like have to have to speak a language that they don't normally, and I don't like. Uh, yeah, it's not spoiler. Several of the characters have to speak Spanish, and I don't. Uh, as my as my Spanish teacher will attest to. I am not good at speaking Spanish, but some of the reviewers do. Some some of the reviewers, yes. some of the user reviews of this movie were written by fluent Spanish speakers, and they say that some of these actually maybe at least one of the critic reviews as well. But anyway, they've said that the yeah some of the cast in this are terrible at at speaking Spanish, so. That is something that, yeah, if, if that's going to bother you, yeah, it'll probably bother you in this. Yeah, it's, it's an American movie. They don't, it's, they're, they're not that good at, at telling, like, if, if, you know, the moment that, the moment that the skin color isn't white, they're like, well, aren't they all kind of the same? And, huh. Yeah, that's that's why this this yeah. Now, so yeah, you know, from from the as far as soap opera goes, from that perspective, this in in this movie, every character has, you know, so yeah, every character has at least some development, and and you can understand who they are, where they're coming from. And yeah, so and one critic pointed out the movie has too many noble main and major characters. This is one of those movies where it simply isn't going to tell you all that much about the characters. So if that means you can't get into the movie, I'm afraid this is a movie you might not be able to get into. The idea is that they're archetypes; they're easy to quickly care about one way or another. You feel empathy for the ones you're meant to, and deep searing hatred for the ones you're meant to. Now, Dennis Quaid plays Secret Service agent Thomas Barnes. He recently started working Secret Service again. He saved the president from taking a bullet, and let's see, I believe that was six months before the events of this one, and after that, he kind of had a nervous breakdown. Some of the other Secret Service agents don't think that he is fully recovered psychologically yet, that he's ready to go out and on the field yet. And that is, of course, you know, we, we, we watch the movie and we worry, is he going to be able to, you know, is he going to be effective against the terrorists? Some people say that he just looks really confused for a lot of it. I don't know, maybe it's just baffling to him that he's playing a second-hand Harrison Ford role as a badass working for the American government. Government, government, but he's not playing with the president. How else is he going to be able to tell someone get off my plane? And yeah, so this is the. I'm going to quote some comments from one of the critics. Site. It looks like Dennis Quaid is trying to remember something really mundane amidst the scene of destruction. I gave that parking attendant a tip, didn't I? And I remember to pack some Tylenol. And Forrest Gump, uh, Whitaker, as Howard Lewis. He's a tourist. He's one of those really devoted to filming everything, which, of course, comes in extremely handy because he's very close when the attacks happen. And, yeah, like Forrest Gump, he manages to be in extremely important places, yeah, at, at the exact right time. Now, I'm going to quote... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and quote from a fellow critic. I agree with some of the other critics I've read who said that the media angle could have been used much more effectively. Instead of Whitaker's character being a bystander, he should have been a journalist. That would have made more sense. I definitely do see where they're coming from. That 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 would have opened up. If, if his character had been a journalist, they could have done more with the media angle. I do think that the fact that he is a bystander also really work like he's the most easy to for for an average 
moviegoer to put ourselves in the shoes of, you know. The the others are yeah, for, for various reasons. Anyway. Sigourney Weaver plays Rex Brooks. She is the GNN. I think it's supposed to be like CNN. I, I don't know if it's a rights issue or something. Which apparently some people lost it. Some people were like, how dare you not call it CNN? And I'm just like, calm down. It's going to be okay. But she's like a producer or... Or direct, I, I don't really know that kind of, but anyway, she's directing news coverage of the president's speech. And, yeah, once again, quoting from the DVD special feature, Plotting and Assassination, the writer talks about showing the perspective of the media, what we'd see if we were at home. And, you know, showing us that Rex, you know, showing Rex had an extreme reaction to the president being assassinated tells us that it is really extreme. Because she's seen everything, you know, there's no, she's, yeah. And it, it works quite well. And, yeah, so William Hurt plays President Harry Ashton. And one of, the, yeah, quoting a fellow critic, the incomparable William Hurt looks sorely miscast as president too. It's doubtful that any politician with as little hair as Hurt could charm voters into putting him in the White House. A reviewer wrote that in 2008, woefully unaware of Donald Trump's presidency and his hair situation. Now, and no, I'm obviously the reason to criticize him is not that he looks ridiculous; it's that he's a monster. Now. And yeah, Matthew Fox plays Secret Service agent Kent Taylor. When he said we have to go back, Kate, I guess he meant back in time. And Saeed, I should look this up. Saeed Takmawi, among other things, known for Wonder Woman one, where he makes a very strong impression. And yeah, he's great in this as well. And. Edgar Ramirez, who actually is in the Born Ultimatum, also so, which which came out before this movie. So I, although filming wise, I'm not certain this this was filmed in 2007, not 2008. So it's possible that he had just gotten done with one of them when he started work on the other. I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, you know maybe that's a way to get some Born mojo going for this movie as well, and. Ayelet Zurer as Veronica, really, really great. I haven't seen her in anything else, but she's apparently, like, Israeli and, yeah, very talented. And Eduardo Noriega as Enrique, who did some tremendous work for Alejandro Minala. And I suppose that is who I will... Yeah, and, and Zoe Zaldana is in it as a, as a reporter. Now... I would say that the the cast all deliver good performances. I've seen some say that all of them have moments where they're good, moments where they're bad. I don't know. I, I I'm not. Sh I, I would say they're good almost all the time. Now, but but yeah, the the I'm going to quote a critic who I disagree with, but. Once again, this is how some people feel about the movie, and I am I try to be fair. I cannot imagine how Travis and Levy ma obtained an A-level cast that includes Hurt, Quaid, Weaver, Forrest Whitaker, Matthew Fox, James Loss, acclaimed Spanish actor Eduardo Noriega, and leading Israeli actress Ayelet Zurer. Worse yet, I can't understand how Travis could have obtained such uniformly stiff, uninspired, and clumsily unpersuasive performances from just about everybody. Quaid and Whitaker, bless their hearts, are the only ones who bring more to the table than the scraps teased from Levy's paltry script. Now, we as the viewer empathize with the protagonists, but not the antagonists. And 
I, actually, I will say, there's at least one antagonist character that you'd be surprised how much you end up empathizing with as well. But, yeah, the, the, I think the, I, I think it was a good idea for the movie to, to make sure that, once again, these are, I, I'm not going to give, give away everybody's backstory situation or the like, but everybody is very easy to, all the good guys are very easy to get, like, you know, I already mentioned Dennis Quaid, you know, we, we as, like, everybody has at some point in their life felt like, I'm not ready for this. I, I, but, I mean, I, I, I have to try. I have to try. And, you know, Forrest Whitaker is, you know, a, a tourist who's, like, you know, I mean, he's basically trying to give his wife some space. There's, you know, maybe some issues there, and, you know, but he, he misses his family. Once again, very easy to empathize with, and it's just pretty much, you know, all of the good guys are very easy to empathize with. Some of them are in situations that are hard for us to imagine ourselves being in, but their reaction to it is something that inspires empathy. Now, the, and there's, there's really great chemistry. I can't really talk about it without giving spoilers, but some of the characters have specific relationships with each other, and you really believe that they have these relationships, even though in real life, obviously, they're actors. And, yeah, I would say all the actors are convincing in their roles, well cast. And the, let's see, the, the dialogue, some of the times characters in this do talk the way people do in real life, None of the none of the dialogue is just white noise. It conveys characterization and exposition well. Some have said it's it's you know the yeah the dialogue is overly expository at times and sometimes very cliched. Now the and there's definitely some of like yelling exposition. Now, the cinematography is done by Amir Mokri, who I, let's see, the, yeah, so the following are movies that they also dp that I've watched. Man of Steel, Lord of War, Taking Lives, and Bad Boys 2. And, yeah, I would definitely say he, 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 he understood how to best approach it. Now... So yeah, the the it is handheld in in this movie, for for the uh, actually I think, I think when it's not in action scenes it might be steady cam, but in at least some of the action it's definitely handheld. So before I start talking about the handheld photography in the movie, I, you know if if it works well, I want to disclose I do prefer traditional cinematography or steady cam tripod. Many of my favorite movies do not use handheld. Following are just a couple of examples that won the Oscar for Best Cinematography. Blade Runner 249, 1917, Inception, Avatar, Lord of the Rings trilogy, and some other examples that, you know, yeah, would be movies that Bill Pope did cinematography for, including the Matrix trilogy, the first Darkman movie, Team America. I love carefully planned frames, camera movement, Everything that takes advantage of very varied angles, but I do appreciate that sometimes handhelds can really put you right in the situation. It feels very real. It feels like what we're seeing in the movie actually happened, and thankfully there were cameramen close to the action capturing it so we can see it. I maintain that it works really well for the Bond movies, more specifically movies two and three in the trilogy. I'm not making any excuses for Jason Bourne the movie. Now, it's yeah I. I love the entire Born trilogy, although I do appreciate that the first one has some strength due to it not being handheld. Some movies should be handheld, others should not. One of the most important aspects in choosing which, of course, there is such a thing as bad handheld, according to 
a Reddit post the first Hunger Games movie for reveal the Taken sequel, the Blair Witch Project. But yeah, for sure, some of the the handheld is that some of the at least some of the action scenes in this are shot with handheld, and I think it was the right choice. It really does put you right there. It is very very intense. And the camera is not excessively shaky during non-action scenes. I, I think during non-action scenes it may very well have been steady cam, but I'm not 100% certain. Maybe it's just that they... Maybe it's not steady cam, but a steady hand handheld. Now, this was edited by Stuart Baird and... Uh, let's see. Right. Who... Uh, yeah, so movies I've watched that Stuart Baird edited... Green Lantern, Salt, Edge of Darkness, Legend of Zorro, Executive Decision. I'm not proud of that one. Maverick, Demolition Man, The Last Boy Scout, Die Hard 2, and the original Superman from 1978. So, yeah, I would definitely say he he knew how to make it work. And, let's see. Yeah, the... Yeah, it, Magnificent in editing and cinematography really pull you in, put you right in the situation if they do get to be flashy once or twice. Now, I think the following is a good point, so I'm just, yeah, but it is a spoiler, so spoiling the movie until you've seen the real man, just under, quoting from my, one of my fellow critics. The filmmakers even break their own rules and abandon the vantage point concept midway through the film. I think it's actually closer to near the... Is it, isn't it more of the last 20 minutes? Anyway, whatever. Rather than 40 minutes. Actually, yeah, it's, it's not... Anyway. Stuart Baird, who edited the film, a veteran of editing slick thrillers and cut all the Richard Donner classics, including Lethal the Weapon, is perhaps too experienced. The film feels like those antiquated, brainless action thrillers from the 80s and 90s, not the realistic, gritty, intelligent, born Bauer era films. No more spoilers for the time being. And, yeah, quoting a fellow critic, superbly edited by action master Stuart Baird, who made a movie with a weapon, who keeps the film racing, sometimes at too feverish a pitch. And I, I, I don't agree that it ever gets quite too fast, but I, I do think it gets really, really close to it. And, yeah, when, when it changes between vantage points, it will do this sort of rewind effect. Some people hated that, and, I yeah, I, I don't know. Again, I, I don't know what to tell you. It, you know, it doesn't last very long, and I don't think it was necessary. Maybe it wasn't necessary. But I don't think it makes the movie worse. And quoting a fellow critic, in an upbeat tone, Owen Gleiberman writing for Entertainment Weekly thought the film was a pulse pounding technological showman whose high strung, quick cut style might be described as JFK meets Paul Greengrass meets Jerry Bruckheimer. That said, it's not the plot that thickens, it's the pulp. Now, they do a quite good job on the special effects. Now, it's, I suppose, I'm not going to be, there, there is, there, there's maybe one or two things that are animated where you can tell that that was animated, you know. But by and large, the special effects are convincing, and the the stunt work is great. Like in in the chasing, you know, people will, like, some some of the chasing includes cars, and yeah, sometimes cars will crash, and people will get hit by cars and such, and yeah, very impressive stunts. And the, the stunts don't, like, take over the movie. And other than the, the public square where the president gives a speech, we see where, where, you know, where the Secret Service planned to protect him. We see, 
you know, some of the terrorists planning things out. And a little of it was actually filmed in Salamanca, Spain, but for a lot of it, Mexico stood in for Salamanca, which is also something that some people had absolute con conniption fits over, but it's like they asked, you know, they asked the government, you know, the, the people of some, uh, not the people, I, I forget who it is you have to, I guess it's government people, they asked the government people of Salamanca, Spain, can we shut down, like, this big chunk of your city, I forget for how many months, and they said no, and so they went to Mexico, what, you know, what else are they supposed to do? And other than, like, okay, yeah, if you know what to look for, you know, like, stop signs. And, like, the, the, yeah, various, like, if you know what you're looking for, you can tell. But they actually do an incredible job. They, they recreated the plaza for some, like, I, let's see, I think, I think the, they filmed the plaza when, when it was, like, of um, establishing shot stuff, like from above, bird's eye view kind of stuff. For that, they used the real plaza, but then they recreated the plaza for some other scenes where they needed to have more control of I think that's how it goes. And you really can't tell, like, you... If I didn't know, I would have guessed they, it was one place. Oh, right, they actually filmed it in 2006. Yeah, that... Someone did not have faith in this movie if they filmed it in 2006 and it only came out in 2008. Yeah. Now, the, the, the action is... Yeah, the, the action is quick, tight, and dirty, not grand and carefully choreographed, and is very tense and suspenseful. This is one of those kinds of movies where the, the heroes are great shots, and, you know, always manage to take out their targets. Somehow none of the bad guys do, so the bad guys never hit any of the good guys. And yeah, if that's something that's going to bother you, it'll bother you this movie. But personally, I thought it was very entertaining. You know, I, I'm aware that it's not realistic, but I, I, yeah, I find the action immensely entertaining and engaging. The movie has a lot of chasing, it's mostly on foot, some in cars, and some compared to the Bourne Ultimatum, and I agree. And some scenes of people shooting each other and such, and yeah, it's, it's, like, they do, they do a, a really good job. I think if you, if you didn't know any better, you might almost, like, basically think that the movie is non-stop action, like, literally non-stop, like, you know, similar to how something like Resident Evil Apocalypse is, you know, there's always something big and dramatic happening. But really, the... It's... it's it just feels like it, you know. It, a lot of the time, it's not that it's action, it's just character stuff and you're like you're engaged you know but the the fact that there is as much action as there is and yet the movie isn't it, it doesn't get to be like repetitive like hypothetically you would think you know considering how much chasing there is in this movie you would think that you know the last chunk of the movie you're just like okay get on with just Stop chasing each other, just, it's, it, I can't anymore, this is too much. And it doesn't, you know, like the, it's, it's right up against the edge again, but stops just short of going, yeah. And, yeah, quoting a fellow critic, there are chase sequences, not just any ch chase scenes, but chases that invade your heart and your throat. Before becoming a filmmaker, the Manchester-born Peter Travis worked his way through film school as a motorcycle courier. <laughs> you can see his low and fast perspective in chase sequences that will take your breath away. And I 100% agree. I hadn't even thought about that before I read that review, but yeah. 
the villains and antagonists are very memorable and honestly very charismatic. And yeah, the the protagonists are all are not all equally interesting. But you know, some of them are fairly compelling, such as Thomas Barnes. And I won't give away exactly what the relationship between you know, protagonist and antagonist is, but I definitely do think it's memorable. The villain plan makes sense, and that is the idea. The the hero plan makes sense, and that's the idea. The the scenes are easy to follow. You know, un unless if if shaky cam is something that's gonna bother you, then it might not be. And yeah, and they are meant to be easy to follow. Now the music is done by Ate Örvarsson. I know I butchered that. The only other movie that I've seen that they scored was The Fourth Kind. But yeah, they do a really good job here. And yeah, once again quoting the DVD special feature in Inside Perspective. You know, the yeah, I am um, I'm not sure from the name, and I forget, so I'm not going to guess the gender. I'm going to say they, the composer. They say that, you know, sometimes it's romantic, sometimes it's intense, sometimes it's this flamenco, and it was their responsibility to make it sound like it's all one score. You know, it can't at some point, it, it can't just sound like it at some point is just a completely different thing, which maybe I were... Uh, Maybe I reference the Resident Evil 2 uh, movies too much, but for some of those, it definitely feels like it's, it's like you're watching an action scene and your neighbor is listening to heavy metal really loudly. It doesn't really go together, and, and here it does. And the, the audio aspect for certain scenes was assembled in editing, and they did a great job. Some of them, it's because what we're seeing isn't happening in real life, you know, effects. Others, it's because the location they filmed that made it very difficult to get good onset audio. And there's some black comedy. And yeah, it's it's pretty good. Now let's see. So yeah, the it's it's not a terribly visually violent movie, but there are, you know, the things you see, you know, like, you know, logically, that's, you know, that's some really messed up stuff. And, yeah, there's no sexual material. There's a little bit of swearing. I would say, you know, there, there's not too much violence. And it's... I suppose an argument could be made that it is in bad taste to keep showing the, the terrorist attack. But it serves a purpose, and sometimes it's cathartic because it happens to characters we don't like. And 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 sometimes the like You know, the, in, in the movie Monster, the violence is unpleasant. We just want it to stop. We don't enjoy the violence. And sometimes this movie does go for that. The, you know, the terrorist attack, in, in some, some movies and TV shows and such, they make it look cool. Here it just looks really, it, yeah, it's, it's very <sighs> tense and, and off-putting. Now. But yeah, if, if you need more detail, the IMDb Parent Guide has more detail. The level of realism is fairly high. You know, you, you need to suspend disbelief to enjoy it somewhat, but like the laws of physics largely apply. There are only some contrivances. No. And it's it's gritty, and I think that was the right choice. 
and it's a very fast-paced movie. The movie does a good job of spacing out the action. You know, I, I think an argument could be made that the, the climax is, you know, based... Yeah, the climax is one chunk of the movie that just has a ton of action in a row. But before the climax, yeah, you know, the somehow it managed, you know, it spaces out the action scenes. There never passes too long without action, which is pretty impressive considering its adherence to the gimmick. Now, yeah, if you count the end credits, the movie is an hour and 26 and a half minutes. And it's worth the investment of time. I suppose if, if you're not interested 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. Some people feel that the movie feels much longer than it actually is. And I've actually also seen some people say that it feels much shorter than it actually is because we see the same 23 minutes of events over and over. Now... Yeah, this isn't really one of those movies where I would say, ah, just only watch certain parts. I, I think if you're going to watch it, it, it makes the most sense to watch the whole thing. Although, again, I'm aware some people think you should skip certain of the man's points. Now, it's not a movie that I wish was longer or shorter. I think it's the right length. Now... Yeah, so I com I compared the, you know, yeah, I, I said there were some similarities between this movie and Without a Trace and NCIS. I've watched every single episode of Without a Trace, and I think season four, the finale of season four was the last NCIS episode that I watched, but up to that point, I watched every single episode. And... Yeah, if you know, if you compare this movie to TV shows, it's somewhat generic. But if you compare it to movies, it's somewhat unique. Now, the best element of the movie is the way the plot keeps you guessing, and it's worth watching through all the way at least once just to experience that. Now, the worst aspect is, if you think too hard while watching, you will notice a number of coincidences. Conveniences, bad decisions made by people who should know better. You kind of just have to just let yourself be swept away by it. And, yeah, I'm going to quote a, a fellow critic here. It requires viewers to react more forcefully from the gut than the mind. Very true. And... I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's just something you have to, like, yeah, if that's not for you, then this movie is not for you, period. But, yeah, you know, now that you know, you know, you can mentally prepare yourself for, for that kind of thing if you do decide to watch the movie. Now, other people say that the worst thing about the movie is that it's repetitive, it's predictable, and the ending is bad, and... So yeah, I, I disagree with all three of those, but I'm not, yeah, there's not really any way you can, if, if that might, you know, for, for people who end up feeling like that, I'm not sure there's really anything you can do to better prepare for that. Now, before watching it, I was, the thing I was most worried about was that it wouldn't be able to keep things interesting enough to keep your attention, but the movie exceeded my expectations. I was most looking forward to the twists and action scenes, and the movie exceeded my expectations. And, you know, this, this is one of those movies where, like, there are a lot of talented people who worked on this. So, you know, I've, I've watched a lot of the other work of many of the people who worked on this. And, yeah, you know, if this is the first thing you watch for many of these, definitely, you know, a lot of them are worth finding other stuff from. Now, the movie is entertaining to watch. 
it's not really one of those movies that leave you in a negative state of mind. And the movie is good as a whole. It doesn't only have good parts. There are some unanswered questions. But it does provide answers to most mysteries. The trailers give away too much. The you know if you if you go to to I, uh, if you go to YouTube, you're already on YouTube if you're watching this. If you hear on YouTube, do a search for a Vantage Point trailer. The ones that come up are two minutes forty-seven seconds, two minutes and thirty-three seconds. Those are the same. The one currently the one that's 2 minutes and 47 seconds is higher quality so watch that one instead and then there's one that's 2 minutes and 3 seconds all of them give away too much but they do also give you a good idea of what the movie is like if you like these trailers you'll like the movie and vice versa. if you don't you won't the cover and poster don't give too much away and they do give you a good idea of what the movie is like So yeah, if you if you like the cover or poster, you'll like the movie, and if you don't, you won't. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to hold up the cover right now because it sometimes ruins the, the focus. But to very briefly, without, yeah, I can, I can just give a quick, you know, the, the cover features, let's see, five different major characters on, you know, it, yeah, appear on the cover, which help tell you that it's an ensemble movie. Now, the movie doesn't have a lot of metaphors or difficult, difficult to understand elements. Like, if, if this is the first, if, if you don't really know how, you know, what the world is like after 9-11, if the you know, like, let's say this is the first movie you watch, like, yeah, the first movie you watch that's about terrorism. If, if you're, like, if you were a kid when 9-11 happened, and, you know, you haven't really watched, you know, maybe your parents didn't allow you to watch movies about terrorism, this is the first one, then it might be a little confusing. The, the way they talk about terrorism, you know, the, the viewer is expected to have, and, and, you know, there's some, there's some, movie shorthand and such, but other than that, it's not confusing to watch. Now... And it's not a movie you need to watch more than once, although, like, if you if you forget something during your first year, maybe watch it, you know, again, but... Yeah, I... I it's never really... Even, even on my first viewing, I understood everything by the, by the end. And it's it's a movie, you know, I've watched it, once again, I'm not certain if it's three times or five times, or four, but I still find it extremely entertaining. This is kind of the, it is kind of one of those kinds of movies that really shouldn't work, but somehow does. Like, you really wouldn't think that it could keep remaining interesting with all these perspective changes. You know it's going to be the same 23 minutes, it's just going to be different event, you know, different perspectives during those 23 minutes and sometimes because we're seeing something like some, sometimes the action moves away from the plaza and something happens that we didn't see before you know but yeah it's it's very impressive that it it manages yeah the movie is better than it has any right to be and it's better than you might expect it to be more than many people say it is, you know, they just, yeah, they managed to keep it interesting throughout. Now, some of the movie is definitely 9-11 porn, and if that's just, if that's the kind of thing that's going to make you not want to watch the movie at all, yeah, there's, there's no getting around that. And... I, I sometimes try to come up with suggestions for how to fix a movie. I don't have any for this, but I do have some suggestions for how some a, a, a different way of doing this that I think could possibly greatly improve it, and I will be 
going into those suggestions at the very start of the notes taken before watching section. Now, when I search on YouTube for videos about this movie, you know, I found three reviews, I found clips and trailers, and nothing else. And, yeah, you know, it's not, it's not something that you necessarily have to dive deep into to really, yeah. Now, on the tomato meter, this has 34 for critics and 57 for users. And the last user review I found was from the 8th of 4th, I forget what the 4th month is called, but now you know. And, yeah, I it's baffling and low to me, but then, yeah, some people, anyway. 158 uh, critics on Rotten Tomatoes reviewed it. And... I didn't count how many pages of user reviews there are. Sometimes I do, but only when there's very few. And yeah, so the, the Rotten Tomatoes critics consensus is the Vantage Point has an interesting premise that is completely undermined by fractured storytelling and wooden performances. And yeah, I to each their own. But uh, yeah, the, the, and on Metacritic, the critic rating is 40 out of 100 and so you, and the user rating is 6.0 out of 10 and the last user review I saw was from the 12th of the 5th month of this year and again that's really really low there are 32 Metacritic yeah critic Meta, Metacritic critic reviews counted and 96 user reviews on IMDb it has a 6.6, .6, which, you know, we're getting a little closer, but yeah. And there are 461 IMDb user reviews, so that is a, a decent amount, but yeah. And this has a PG-13 rating for by the MPAA, and I agree. For some reason, it, the rating is 15 in my country, but then we don't have a PG-13 we have 11 and 15, and I guess they felt it was too much for 11-year-olds. I mean, I guess I can kind of see what they mean. I don't, I don't think I would have a problem showing this to an 11-year-old, as long as they, you know, not, not just any 11-year-old, but someone who was already watching action movies. But yeah. And, yeah, I, I recommend this to people... You know, if at all the gimmick appeals to you, and the negative reviews don't put you off, I recommend this too. Now, let's see the so so yeah, the DVD comes with an informative and fun director's commentary track, two interesting featurettes totaling 41 minutes, three trailers and one deleted scene. So, yeah, if you can find it on sale, the DVD is is decent. You know, it has a decent amount of, of content. I give this seven different angles on the same events out of ten. And that is it for the review section. So, entering the thoughts section, spoilers from here on out. With no warning for when I spoil this movie, I will only be warning when I spoil other movies. Thoughts section start. Disclaimers. If you don't care about these disclaimers, I try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice with the description box. I often try to talk very fast during disclaimers, since a lot of this is very standard information. I might be keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once again to the video itself. With that said, with that said, please do note that some specific special note the movie may be in this section. I realize this is very long, I'm gonna do what I can to make it worth your time. Now uh, Content warning and or trigger warning, I'm going to be discussing the potentially triggering content of this movie, torture, kidnapping, gaslighting, and murder. And terrorism, obviously. I don't have a problem with violence in the world in general, but things from my favorite horror movies and in general, also have a problem with supply video drama, etc. I don't have a problem with film, sexuality, and disturbing and upsetting material in, in general, monsters from my favorite movies. 
I might swear in this video, but probably not more than they do in the movie. Instead of me quoting all the lines out from this movie, let me just say here, I love every line they put in the IMDb quote section, so you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. The rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it's analysis, some of it's MST compared with facts and other jokes. And, yeah, so the time codes for the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is the I have on watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, and the like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching. And the final section I get into stuff I think it's worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MD, and Wikipedia. And so, sometimes for these, I try to wonder, does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? And whether it does or not, do I think that they made the right choice? I mean, the movie doesn't really have empathy for the terrorists themselves. So, Veronica, I have to admit, I, I don't remember... I remember that Sam has, he, he, they call him by a different name when, you know, he introduces himself to Howard as Sam. I'm going to just be calling him Sam. So, Veronica, Sam, and the couple of other terrorists we see, and Kent, we, yeah, the, the movie doesn't really have empathy for them, and I do think that slightly undermines that the movie is trying to, like, let's see, what's a, a good example of, like, for example, by the end of the movie, we know that the, you know, Kent, a Secret Serviceman, is actually one of the bad guys, so, you know, we when we see, you know, a Secret Serviceman, we assume that they're you know, they're fighting to protect the president, that they would never take part in kidnapping him. So, you know, that's a thing that's, yeah. And, you know, the first time we see Eduardo Noriega, you know, run towards the, the podium, we, yeah, we, we're also like, ooh, that guy looks dangerous. Because he doesn't, you know, we, there's this slight ethnic equality, but that's all, you know, and let's see, yeah, so, so, you know, there are several things where the movie tries to, to make us think that someone is, is good, and then it turns out they're evil, and, and vice versa, but at the end of the day, I mean, I, yeah, I suppose you could say maybe the most effective one is when Javier, turns out, you know, we, we realize that he's not actually evil. You know, he works with the bad guys, yes, but he's just he just wants his brother back. And yeah, you know, when the first time you see him, he he's he's got this intense look and again, you know, he's not white, so Americans immediately think that guy's dangerous, but then, you know, we find out that he's actually He's a good person forced to do something awful. But yeah, the, the, ultimately, the movie does kind of undermine that it doesn't, you know, yeah, at the end of the day, the most prominent of the terrorists are, you know, they, they have darker skin. Or, you know, so they're not, they're not just white, at least. They're, you know. Now, let's see. And I also, it's not great that, like, the woman who has, let's see, the, the women who have screen time, Rex is fun. She's, she's a, like, curmudgeon, cynical character. But, you know, she doesn't have a lot of screen time. But, and, and she does, she helps Howard. She's the one, it's it's because of her that Howard, not Howard, Barnes, she helps Barnes realize that Kent 
is working with the bad guys, you know. And, yeah, you know, Angie dies really quickly and doesn't have any screen time after that. You know, from, from other perspectives. I mean, hypothetically, they could have. Other than that, Veronica is... I, I think Veronica is the one who has the most screen time overall. I could be wrong. Maybe it is Rex. But anyway, she's one of the bad guys, and she's the she's the stereotypical movie tropey duplicitous woman. You know, her boyfriend feels like there's something going on, but she claims that she's she's in love with him and it's you know he has nothing to worry about but then we find out she has a horrible secret uh, the, the movie didn't need to do that you know and i think that might be it for this section so my making jokes in this video should not be taken as me thinking the thing i'm joking about is bad or making light of a serious subject I simply find it very difficult not to MST through again, overanalyze everything I watch. And that brings us to the next section. Notes taken while watching. Honestly, I could watch Sigourney Weaver bark orders at people for like, if the entire movie was just her character, you know, her, her cynical curmudgeon character trying to, to get, you know, like, she's like, it's like training a freaking dog, you know, and, and like, come on, people, dude. Angie, would you please leave the punditry to someone who's paid to have an opinion, and, you know, all, all these things, like, which, I mean, I'm not, I don't approve of that. I think journalists should be allowed to say what they think, at least when, when what they you know, when it, when, when what they're saying and is, is based on reality rather than ugly stereotypes and such, but it's funny, it's funny when she, the way she delivers it, you know, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think, actually, no, never mind, I don't think, I know, there is no movie, I have never been watching a movie and been like, this has too much Sigourney Weaver in it, this is, the, 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 the ratio of Sigourney Weaver to uh, compared to other actors is simply out of whack. There is there is too much Sigourney Weaver, and I will not stand for it. Never, not in a million years. No matter how bad the Alien sequels got, still, all about that Sigourney Weaver. Now, the the S S Sigourney Weaver. Uh, should I call her Rex? I guess I could keep calling her Sigourney Weaver because she's very, like, it's a very typical Sigourney Weaver role. You know, she's she's authoritative. She she knows she's right. As it, I mean, at the end of the day, Angie is it's not the right show for that at the very least. You know, so so yeah, Sigourney Weaver tells the the guy, oh, you know, Barnes, that's the guy, and then they bring up the clip where where he took a bullet for President Ashton. And they actually rewind it. I was half expecting them to play that over as well, since we know this is a movie very fond of showing someone shoot the president over and over. Now, so so yeah, I noted that the first vantage point is around 8 minutes and 10 seconds. Maybe a little less. Maybe the very first bit of that was just opening sequence stuff, but yeah. And... Kent watches GNN in the car, telling us when we are in the timeline. You know, we're, we're seeing Angie... Ah, what's it called? Yeah. Angie, right before Rex tells her to stop the punditry. And when Barnes steps out of the limousine, you see all these camera flashes. Right, I briefly want to say, I, I kind of like the bit where, like, some of the Secret Service men are like, Come on, Kent. He's not. He's not ready yet. And like, one one of them is like, "What are the odds that he?" I, I don't remember the exact line, but something like, "He's he's gonna freak out just walking there," and and because Barnes was walking, you know, he he heard them. He's like, "I put it at 50-50s. It's, you know, it's 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 a straightforward joke. It's not it's not like, 
Yeah, Shakespeare. Shakespeare did two jokes. It's not Shakespeare, but it works. But yeah, you know, he steps out of the limousine, you see all these camera flashes, and you know, we, we start worry, oh, he may not be ready to go back on the job. It's such a relief to see the American president say, oh, what a beautiful baby, and for that baby to not be wearing QAnon onesie. It's very easy to understand and sympathize with Barnes grabbing the guy in the crowd. That really did look like the guy was going for a gun, not a camera. I mean, if he's going to take pictures, why doesn't he have the camera out when the limousine stops? You know, it's just, yeah. And Barnes hesitates to tell Control about the things he sees in, you know, the window, because he did just make a mistake with the guy in the crowd, but ultimately he does call it in. And we see that Howie spots something, you know, and, and he's surprised. But we don't get to see what it is until we see his vantage point. And after the explosion, Barnes is really dazed. They do a good job with the cinematography and editing to convey that. And Rex is like, Camera 3, can you hear me? And we find out later that Camera 3 is working for the terrorists. That's why he seems to not be responding to Rex. And the one working for Rex tries to convey the information to a cameraman so they can film the suspect. You know, as as Barnes is like, okay, it's, yeah, yeah, I, I think that's the thing they do. Yeah, okay, he's he's heading west. He's you know head past the building, and the suspect looks like this and this. You know, and and she's like, okay, so they're heading west, and the suspect looks like this and this. It's just. You know, we, we can understand why they, they, they want to be part of the story. And the next vantage point starts 21 minutes and 40 seconds in. So vantage point two was 13 minutes. And from Ed, Eduardo Noriega's perspective, it really does look like his girlfriend is romantically involved with Javier. You have a glow about you. Well, in her defense, it's not every day you get to kidnap POTUS. It's a good detail that... Let's see. Um, yeah, things that were done or... What's that say? That Howard said some things that we didn't hear. In, no, Noriega, yeah, Edward, Noriega says some things that we didn't hear in Barnes' vantage point because Barnes was so preoccupied. This is the kind of thing that happens. I've been in conversations where afterwards some of the people didn't remember a lot of what was said because they were preoccupied. And 26, 20, 26 minutes in, we get our first foot chase. Up until now, it's been shooting, you know, the, the shooting of the president, explosions, tension and suspense. And Edward Noriega manages to get to the underpass and then we go back. And the next vantage point starts 29 minutes and 10 seconds in, so seven and a half minutes vantage point. I'm really glad that they didn't try to force that it was every, that it had to be the same amount of time every time. I really like the detail that from Howard's point of view, it actually seems very friendly, very tourist friendly. All he sees are a bunch of happy Italians waving their country's flag. And Sam seems like a, a, such a friendly tourist, or later we realize he's just there trying to make sure that Howard didn't and doesn't film anything incriminating. Like, basically, if he had, if he had felt confident that Howard had seen something, he would have tried to get the camera from him or something. And we also see Sam is carrying one of the Spanish flags, so we think of him as just another friendly tourist in the sea of friendly tourists that Howard is swimming in. It's really easy to empathize with Howard and Anna when she accidentally bumps into him with her ice cream. She said that she lost her ice cream, and it's clearly, you know, it's, it's a hot day. And he doesn't want her to feel bad because she reminds him of his own son, so it's like, yeah. 
and you know he even offers like I, I can buy her another ice cream but she's probably like I I really can't be t teaching my she's I don't know she's eight years old or something if she bumps into into a stranger and and ruins her ice cream like that I'm not gonna just buy a new one or she'll never learn to like you know yeah and and that is Anna's one defining character trait is she wants to be near her mother and she's she's not good at like making sure she doesn't walk you know, bump into someone or walk into a place that's dangerous. And Howard sees that Barnes saw something, so he films it and zooms in, and because of the zoom, we can see there really was someone up there. It wasn't just a fan. And it's also, it's that thing of, like, Barnes is almost, like, he's he's basically overwhelmed. You know, that's, actually, yeah, that's the thing. We, we see, we, once we see it, Eduardo Noriega's advanced point, we realized that there was actually a lot there that, you know, that, that he completely missed. And, yeah, it, you know, he, he probably isn't 100% ready and basically Kent, yeah, I'll be, I'll be talking about that in the next section, how Kent clearly, he, he wanted someone that he felt wouldn't be ready. It's kind of clever that after shooting the president's double, the terrorists kidnap the president and put him in an ambulance. So if somebody checks the ambulance, they could just say, yeah, it's the president. He was shot. How is this news to you? Like, it's all over TV. It's very easy to empathize with Howard when he calls his wife. After the explosion, Anna is now one of the victims, where before she was just this sweet little girl. You know, we empathize with her before we empathize with her now, but the empathy has a different tone. Now we're like concerned about her. And Howard catches up to Eduardo Noriega and we see what happened right after the cliffhanger ending. And another vantage point ends at 40 minutes, 40 seconds. So it is probably in bad taste that one of the cliffhangers is a little girl possibly being run over by an ambulance. We have to wait minutes before we find out if she is or not. And actually, yeah, so, so let's see. 40 minutes and 40 seconds. I think it's, let's see, is it maybe almost 30 minutes before it's resolved? So an hour and 10 minutes? Yeah, I think something like that. That's, yeah, they, they didn't have to do that. And we get the president's vantage point and realize that he wasn't actually shot. It was his double. You're not, we're, you're not thinking of pulling out entirely? Why would we? Because people are going to make mock that decision online for many years to come. And we see how far away from the plaza the real president is. And it moves so fast that you don't think about the fact that this might be where that first explosion occurred. The one we only heard and not saw. Bombing Morocco is exactly what these terrorists want. Precisely. I don't know how... Like, there are viewers who somehow missed that. That's literally, like, the whole point. The terrorists want for the... I guess not the president himself, since they're kidnapping him, but they want the, the vice president. You know, if you take the... the just the... the What's it called? A uh, capital. If you shorten vantage point, it becomes VP, which could also stand for vice president. But yeah, if, you know, they, they basically want the vice president to over, you know, to, to bomb Morocco, which, as the president points out, is a friendly nation. You know, the whole point of this, like, yeah, I, I try not to judge people, but I really don't know how Apparently, a bunch of people missed this when watching the movie. The the co you know the coalition is for for a bunch you know a, a lot of countries who disagree on a number of things to agree on how to fight terrorism. So terrorists attack it, trying to lure 
the American president, really the vice president, you know, they, they basically they make it look like the American president is dead to, you know, trick the vice president into bombing a country that is friendly to the U.S. And I, I don't think it's ever said, but I'm guessing the some of the Moroccan leadership is going to be part of this coalition, you know. So, like, right there, if they do that bombing, that's it. You know, the, the coalition is going to start falling apart immediately, you know. And, and at that point, it's like, you know, other countries might leave in addition to Morocco because they're like, well, I mean, if you... We, we don't want to look like we're more friendly to America than to the Moroccans. And, yeah. Yeah, I, I think I saw at least some say, you know, well, if people think the president is dead, how can you, you know, what what's the point of kidnapping him if, if everybody thinks he's dead? Well, I mean, if they show footage and they can prove that it's the, the I mean, just have, force him to say something that only the president would be able to say and hold up a newspaper to confirm the, the you know, the date, yeah, the, the date, voila, and then the, yeah, it's, it's, it's really not that complicated. I, I agree with those who say that the, the plot is overly complicated, and it's only overly complicated so that they can keep revealing things over the entire duration of the film. That's for sure true. You know, and another thing is, like, Again, somehow people missed, but, you know, some, some people were like, well, why wasn't there a shooter up there in the window? Kent literally spells this out. He literally says, Barnes is starting a manhunt for a shooter that doesn't exist. Like, they're literally looking for the wrong thing. Like, if, if, he, if Barnes knew that the president had been kidnapped, he would be telling, you know, he'd be like, okay, we have to stop every car, stop and search every car, no car leaves this area. But no, he's looking for a person on foot who might even be carrying a rifle, you know, might, yeah, might be carrying something that, that could potentially be a rifle, you know, yeah. We're fine here. We're safe. Nobody told the shooter that. And 49 minutes and 40 seconds in, another vantage point ends. And we go to the Spec Ops guy, and Sam, I'm not entirely sure, I guess maybe this is just kind of cutting back and forth between the different people working for the terrorists, I guess. At least Javier, and Sam, and people that Sam talks to on the phone. Anyway, Javier grabbing Veronica angrily in the tense conversation you know, you can still understand how that looks like adultery to the jealous boyfriend. You know, like, he can imagine that she's cheating on him. He can not imagine that she's a terrorist, you know, and it is that, yeah. Now. And Javier passes, you know, he, he passes a scan, but, you know, the undercover hotel worker hands him this little thing that, yeah. Now, my DVD cuts out at 54 minutes, and I, I'm only able to watch on from an hour and four minutes in. I have watched the whole thing at least once before. I do vaguely remember what is in that 10-minute segment. In the elevator, Javier reluctantly accepts that he has to keep going along before he can see his brother again. Again, I feel like that's a good, it's it's a good little scene. Like, if if not for that scene, you'd be like, can't he just pressure one of them? No, he can't, you know. She's, like she says, he'll be at the underpass. When you go to the underpass, when you've done everything we've asked you to do, and you go to the underpass, you'll get your brother back. And I, yeah, just really briefly. Some people didn't understand why they have to pressure someone into the the being an assassin for them. 
instead of just finding an assassin who agrees with them politically, for one thing, if you're going around and, like, talking to, like, special forces people, and you're like, so, from a scale of 1 to 10, like, the American president, I'm just, I'm just gonna throw something out, out there, he, it's probably gonna sound crazy, but just, on, on a scale of 1 to 10, how do you feel about him not being kidnapped? being kind of kidnapped and being really, really kidnapped. Just, just, you know, I'm just, just throwing out there. Let me know what you think. You know, if it's, obviously that's not how they're going to go about it. I'm not saying that. But just, if you're going around to, like, really well-trained military people and you're, like, trying to, to figure out if they would work with, like, Think about just if if just one of those people contacts the government and says, "Look, I have military training, and some people approached me and tried to talk about like, you know, how how if if you know where, where I stand on this, this, and this. I really think they're trying to plan some kind of you know a terrorist attack. You should make sure there's more security, and you know there goes." The, the plan for the terrorists. But if they pressure this guy, yeah. So I'm not 100% certain at what time code in the movie it abandons the vantage point idea and just cuts back to the back and Sorry. Just cuts back and forth between the good guys and the bad guys and when the, the long car chase begins. But it's at least an hour and four minutes. And yeah, so I already mentioned, you know, the Kent says, you know, he's created a manhunt for a shooter that doesn't exist. Yeah, some some people didn't understand why both pretend to shoot POTUS and kidnap him. See. Some people say that the car chase ending seemed to go on forever. I think the fact that it's intercut with other things helped make it feel not so inter interminable. And Javi reaches Eduardo Noriega, and the two of them have no idea what the other is talking about. Since Javier and Thomas are both technically good guys, they are allowed to hit each other with gunfire. And Kent gets badly hurt in his one car wreck, even though Barnes walked away from both of his with barely a limp. And if you if you remember it as oh well Kent's car crash was worse, rewatch the the like seriously one of the ones that Barnes has it's absurd that he walks away from. Possibly both of them, but at least one of them. And Howard manages to save Anna's life, which apparently wasn't enough for some user reviewers since they would write that they didn't understand why he was in the movie, what was the point of his character. Like, I'm not going to say, again, it's not Shakespeare, but it works. You know, it's it's a it's a small child in danger. Of course, we want to see them saved, you know. And, and I mean, he's a, he's a tourist. Of course, he's not going to shoot somebody. Now, let's see. I mean, I will say, if hypothetically, if they rewrote the movie so he didn't save Anna, and he was just running around, okay, at the you know, at that point, he doesn't really accomplish anything after he helps Barnes, you know, he, he shows Barnes some of the video and helps clear Eduardo Noriega's name. And Barnes gets to the president, managing to save him again, and the president is relieved since Barnes, he knows he can trust. And this is at a time when otherwise he is not certain who he can trust. But yeah, the, the, I don't know. Maybe I'm just, I'm, I'm a real mark for stuff like that, but I kind of like that the president gets to fight back, you know, like the, you know, he, 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 did he actually fall down or was he just pretending to so that they, so that he'd get his hand, yeah, no, yeah, actually, I think, yeah, he's like, you know, he's, he's lying there and he's like, okay, they're not really paying attention to me, so, oh, what, no, oh, I, I fell over, you know, he, he doesn't make it. 
much, obviously. And and they, you know, one of them is like, he, he fell over, and the other one's like, it doesn't matter, just leave him there. And, you know, once he hears that, he, like, grabs one of these, like, ah, uh, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. It's, it's, like a, it's like a stick, metal stick. Is, maybe, is it one of the arms of, of the gurney thing? I, I don't know, I'm not 100 percent certain, but he's got that ready, and then once the vehicle crashes, or is it before? I, no, is, is it slightly before the vehicle crashes, but he's like, he's attacking them with that thing, and just, I, I don't know, I like it, I like it. And the, the yeah, is obviously 100% ridiculous. The, you know, the two terrorists are both like they have their seat belts and I don't know do do ambulances have uh, what, what are they called again Air, airbags I forget if they I'm not certain if, you know do they do they not have airbags I'm not sure anyway but they like they're they're you know one of them's just barely still alive but the president who was lying on the the floor of the ambulance which let's not forget it didn't just like stop. It didn't just like crash. It keeled over on the side and like you know, it 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 kept moving after it hit the side after it went over on the side for like a while and then the doors open and he's just there and he's fine. Like he's you know, ah give me a minute and, and then we can start the, the the marathon. But it's just it's ridiculous. It's absolutely absurd and I'm here for it. So yeah, I, I didn't note when the car chase ends, but the movie's an hour and 20 minutes without end credits. I'd say the last two minutes don't have any car chase, so the car chase is at least 14 minutes long. I can understand why some people feel that's excessive, but again, it is intercut with other things. I saw someone say that the two Secret Service agents, that, that it kind of looks like shot Edward Noriega in Howard's vantage point, simply aren't there the next time we see that situation. I tried to come up with an explanation. I think basically, like, they missed that. Like, it was a script rewrite, and they just, they missed that because, yeah, I, I, like, right after that happens, like, Kent runs up and gets in a, let's see, yeah, Kent gets in, yeah, yeah, Kent shoots Javier, and then he gets in a car and drives away. If there were two Secret Service men nearby and they see Kent shoot, like, I don't know if they can recognize Kent. I'm not certain how long, how far away they are, but they're definitely going to be like, sir, put the gun down, you know, and yeah, there goes the scene. So it's, yeah, it's, it's too bad. And really, I mean, all that had to happen, like, if they had just written that, oh, you know, they, they almost made it, but then they got run, they were, they were run over. That's really all that had to happen for it to, yeah, too bad. I still hold the script and direction in really high regard. So that brings us to the next section. And it's titled, Notes Taken Before Watching. So as promised, I will go directly into the so again this is not I'm not saying that the movie is is broken and needs fixing these are just some some you know something I thought of that I feel like could make the oh right just really really quickly I feel bad for Sigourney Weaver considering how talented she is and then all she really gets to do in this is bark orders at her subordinates, but she does sell it. Look, she has one job in this movie, it's lame, but she's gonna do it, okay? But, yeah. Then I'll go right in. Oh, right, Ayala Tsura. She's, she's in Munich and Man of Steel, so I have seen her in something. Anyway, yes, so... Some critics have pointed out that the movie doesn't really explore how different subjective perspectives lead to different opinions of what's going on, so much as it basically says that if you don't have all the information, then you can't objectively know what happened. Like, by the end of the movie, we, the audience, know objectively what happened. And 
I'm not sure any one character does know everything that happened, but it's not really necessary. You know, by the end of the movie, the good guys know who, you know, who the bad guys are and who, who they thought were good guys, but they're now, and they turn out to be bad guys, and they stopped all the bad guys, and the president is alive, roll credits, you know. But early on, it appears to go for subjective, by the, yeah, by the end, we the viewer have all the information, we do know objectively what happened. I think it might have been interesting to make the movie slightly differently, and it's entirely possible that the movie I'm, a, you know, I'm about to describe already exists. If so, please put the title in the comments. Maybe it should have ha had only like two different vantage points, and instead of the exact same time frame, maybe the second one starts further back than the first. The first one is Joe, an American who only sees the terrorist attack carried out by Middle Eastern terrorists and thinks that Americans are innocent and Middle Easterns are all terrorists. But the second perspective should be that of a Middle Eastern Muslim, Ahmed. It starts back when the American military was consistently provoking Middle Easterners, trying to start a conflict, and thus from his point of view, of course at least some Muslims are going to want the American military to stop. He doesn't agree with terrorism, but he doesn't think that Americans are completely innocent in it. And near the end of the movie, the two of them are face to face. All Joe can see is another terrorist, and Ahmed sees an apologist for the provocation carried out by the American military. Both of them have significant trouble seeing things from each other's point of view. I don't know exactly how you end it in a satisfying way, but I do think it should definitely try to open a discussion on how to help make sure that both can see things from the other's point of view, how to properly solve the conflict. Now, I don't really, so yeah, moving on from that, um, I, that, that is, that is it from that, so, moving on, I don't really like when a piece of fiction tricks you into thinking that someone died and then it turns out that it was their double, as we find out here, or some other way of keeping them alive. In this movie, at least they do have the real present in danger after that, until the end of the movie, and, yeah, so we, we know that he wasn't, you know, 41 minutes and 30 seconds and we know that he wasn't actually shot which is let's see yeah when I, yeah when I first wrote this I thought it was 30 minutes but I it, I know it must be less because the first vantage point was eight minutes so it's maybe 30 35 minutes or something which is almost half the movie so yeah that is a bit and I don't it didn't need to be it's it's there because they wanted a lot of twists you know if if the if you spend a lot of the movie trying to guess who you know who really shot the president and then it turns out oh the president wasn't shot well then the movie is still just you know surprising you and that's it's, yeah that's also why the, there isn't a real shooter it's this you know some some people point out that into you know the the phone there was ridiculously like useful you know for 2008 for sure if this movie was made today, I'd be like, well, you know, the, the they kind of have to figure out which is which is riskier. Do they pay for the app, or do they accept ads and worry that an ad might show up really close to when they need to fire the gun? Because if they pay, they might, you, you know, they could be tracked by their financial information. But yeah, today, honestly, I believe that there is an there there could easily be an app that can actually yeah it's it's okay I'm slightly exaggerating I'm slightly joking here I'm just saying apps can do it's it's wild how much apps can do today I like that a lot of the twin uh, I like a lot of the twists and I really appreciate that by the end of this we realize that at least one of the bad guys is actually the white dude that we entrust him implicitly Matthew Fox. Who, I mean, he has a trustworthy face, you know, when we see him on Lost, it also doesn't take uh, very long to trust him. I realize it's not ideally handled, since early on the movie does make us think that, yeah, that, that the, that the non-white characters in the movie are evil, but this movie does do a pretty good job of challenging racist biases. Early on, we think that the attack was organized by certain foreign agents so that the president's staff could convince him uh, let's see. Yeah. 
Okay, I am not sure, but some of these notes I don't go back and check properly. But anyway, like yeah, early on, from from fairly early on, it's, yeah, from from very early on, we think that Eduardo Noriega may have something to do with it, and not long after that, we think that Javier is evil, and you know, by the end of it, we know that Noriega didn't intentionally have anything to do with it, and that Javier was only doing it so that his brother would not be killed. Some conservative viewers thought that the president should have bombed the people that he was told by his aides had done it, despite the fact that the film, like, you know, the, the, yeah, the text of the film points out that's the wrong thing to do. It's, it's a, you know, they're a friendly nation, but yeah, some viewers are just so stubborn and biased. I mean, if you disagree with how it is in the movie, just say you disagree with how it is in the movie, but they just ignored the fact that the movie said that it definitely, like, that, that it was clearly just an excuse to get, yeah. I've seen some say that they thought it was ridiculous, the end of the movie, that the terrorists... Yeah, the, the terrorists are careful to avoid running over the little girl staying on the road since they already killed so many people. I agree that it could... It's 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 a little underwhelming. You know, you, you wanted something more like... Yeah, but... I don't really agree that it's... That it doesn't hold up to scrutiny. I think it's important to remember that when the bombs were going off, they didn't have to look anyone in the eyes as they were dying, which... They would if they ran over the girl, and it also wasn't something they had emotionally prepared themselves for. So, again, unlike the actual bombings, which were planned. Some people's... Uh, yeah. By the end, the innocent turned out to be guilty, the guilty turned out to be innocent. I, I really like how the movie manages, and you know, you spend a chunk of the movie trying to figure out who the shooter was, and then you find out there was technically no, like, there wasn't a person up there. Some say the girl should have gotten out of the way of the ambulance, but a lot of people freeze in place when scared. I'm not saying the following is revolutionary, but it is good craftsmanship, and I believe in calling out good craftsmanship when you find it. This does a good job of using archetypes. One example would be that Kent starts out as the archetypal, supportive, friend who believes that a major character deserves a second chance to prove himself. In this case, not so much a chance to prove himself, but a chance to prove that he still got what it takes, you know. But then by the end of the movie, we know that in reality, he was just pretending to be a friend. And in fact, he was the archetypal traitor who gets close to a major character specifically so that they can manipulate him. This means that early on, we think very highly of his character, the world needs more people like that, but by the end, we hate his guts and can't wait to see him taken out, especially by Barnes. So, you know, without devoting a lot of screen time to developing these characters, it still achieves that we have a strong emotional connection. It's easier for us to empathize with Thomas. He didn't do anything wrong. In fact, he did the exact right thing. I mean, even if you don't like a certain president, you have to admit, if you take a job as Secret Service agent, the right thing is taking a bullet for the president. I actually, I saw a, a Rotten Tomatoes user review who said, okay, sue me, I'm not going to be able to, if, if, if it's Trump, I can't take a bullet for him. Which, yeah, I can, I can understand, but I, I would say then you have to resign the Secret Service, too. It, it, you can't, that's not, I don't, I don't, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't saying really anything. Some, sometimes people think that I'm I'm being completely deadpan serious when I'm joking, so sometimes I overcorrect. Anyway, but as a direct consequence of doing the right thing, he's now not as trusted, tr trusted as much as if, you know, as, as the other Secret Service agents, which is obviously unfair, and most audience members hate unfairness. Some critics really hate the fact that at the end of the movie, it does abandon the subjective perspective thing and plays out like an usual action movie. 
I mean, it had to, though. You know, the, there at the end, let's see. We've already seen the perspective of Howard, Barnes, let's see. Yeah, I mean, it's right at the tail end of Javier and Eduardo Noriega, Noriega's. So, but yeah, they, they both die there. But yeah, so Barnes, Tom, uh, Barnes, Howard, and the the terrorists. Though they, yeah, they're, they're basically they're the three that are, you know. It kind of had to to just go go to the the, yeah, it it just it, the movie would have the the. The last chunk of the movie would have to be completely different if it was still going by the the one perspective at a time thing. And I, I don't think that, you know, I, I think by then the point has been made. The It's it's not that the movie, you know, it's, it's not a, it's not a game of the floor is lava. It's not that it's it's not a it's not a Bigfoot sighting. It, it doesn't. The movie isn't ruined by one chunk of the movie not using subjective perspectives. I think the movie would stop working if there were two subjective perspectives that basically said the same thing. That would be a problem. But yeah, near the end of the movie, the movie abandons the subjective perspective because we already, by then we know the objective truth. You know, it, the movie has made the point that if you don't have all the information, you can't know the objective truth. You can really understand how this movie's events could really make William Hurt turn very bitter and angry, become a general, and start barking orders at people trying to capture the Hulk. I really appreciate that basically every single major character is featured very early in this movie. For a number of them, we just don't realize how important they are until later. Like, Sam and Veronica, you really don't think are going to be that big a deal before you realize that they're terrorists. I agree with those that say that there are some choices made by characters in the movie that are not the most logical, but they do make the movie more interesting and memorable. That's why the Spanish guy thinks his girlfriend is cheating. That's why the terrorist blackmail a special forces operative whose brother they kidnap, etc. Now, let's see. Yeah, so some, some question how it would be useful for the terrorists to kidnap the president. The way I see it, the moment that you have someone be kidnapped in a movie, the audience are focusing on hoping that they get, you know, that they're freed. Which, you know, if, if he was shot, it would be, yeah, then we can't focus on them being rescued. And if we knew from the start that he was kidnapped, not shot, then we'd be trying to figure out who's kidnapping him and why, instead of who's shooting him and why. But if you want to try to make sense of it in story, then I figured that they're going to hold them hostage until they get their demands met. Which would be substantially more, like, they have a much greater chance of getting their demands met if they hold a hostage than if they shoot someone and then say, okay, now do what we want, you know. Some people don't think it makes sense for the girl to be on the road at the end of the movie. I can see an argument that we... Actually, yeah, now it's... We do basically, we do see how she got. No, we, yeah, yeah, we don't, yeah, I can see an argument made that we should see how she got away from the person looking after her last time we saw her. You know, the, the Howard grabs her, gets her to a cop, and then the next time we see her, she's just out on her own. I, I think the idea is that in the chaos, the cop lost track. But I think an argument could be made that we should have seen that. It's almost a cheat that we just suddenly see her on, you know, but yeah. Let's see, but it, yeah, you know, she clearly isn't very good at watching where she walks. She also bumped into Howard and lost her ice cream, which clearly upset her. She was really happy that she had that ice cream, and then she loses it and is very sad. She's, she's just not that good at looking where she's going yet. And, you know, do keep in mind, when she runs into the street, her mother is right on the other side of the street. The problem is that she stops running. If she just kept running, there wouldn't really have been a problem. But, again, she... I mean, 
if you are in a dangerous situation and you stand completely still, if you live in the woods and you, you, you don't move at all, the animal that noticed you might think you're already dead, and a lot of predatory animals don't eat things that are already dead. They, they want to kill them themselves, and so they, or, or, they no long, or they won't perceive a dead body as a threat. You know, it's, yeah, our, our brains evolved for, for that specific purpose. It's, it's not very useful in that situation, but I'm, if, you, if you, the viewer, watching my video right now, say that you never, when you were a child, not once did you ever get into a situation where you suddenly just got scared and froze up instead of doing something that would be more constructive. I, just, I don't believe you. You're just, you're not, you're going to have to sell that one to someone else. Now, I've seen some point out that, you know, in, in real life, Secret Service agents would not be like hunting down someone. You know, they, they, they stay with the president, they try to protect the president, but, like, if there's a suspect, you know, if, they, if there's a suspected shooter, they're not going to go out and try to hunt him down. That's going to be some, you know, I, I don't know exactly who it would be in that situation, but it would be someone else. I think the idea is that a lot of regular Americans, when they watch movies like this, they want to see the protagonist hunting down the bad guys. Anything else would be disappointing. And see. yeah, so I yeah, so YouTube videos I rewatched Renegade Cut's video on Rashomon where I mean he he barely talks about this movie at all. He just he shows clips from it, but you know it's a good video. I like rewatching it. But yeah, so the trailers the let's see yeah the the two minutes thirty thirty three seconds or too many forty seven seconds and thirty same do a good job of setting up the idea of the eight different perspectives. It does give away early on that the president is not the one who was shot. A pretty cool trailer. Gives you a good idea of what the movie's like. And the, yeah, the two minute, three second one, it's very similar to the other one. And it also gives away the president is still alive. It's almost the exact same one. I think it's possible that the only difference is that in this one, the, like, they they speak stuff that in the other one is just text. You know, it's it in the first one it it writes eight different perspectives, and then the other one it's there's a there's you know the the trailer man voice guy says eight different perspectives. So yeah, and yeah, so I watched various reviews. One of them, in in one of them that one, someone jokes eight different points of view. You think at least one of them was good. And they criticized me for being melodramatic. Definitely true. I'm here for it. I'm here for the melodrama. What can I say? Not for every movie. For sure not for every movie. But for this one, it just... Yeah. And so the terrorist is ridiculous. The car chase is ridiculous. It got funnier the longer it went. It's, it was a funny video. I subscribed to them based on it. And... Let's, yeah, and, and this other review... So they, they called it the... Yeah, film club review, and one of them compared it to Crash. Says that movie ties together all the stories at the end. This one doesn't, and they they thought that was bad about this movie. Described the ending car chase as generic Hollywood action scene. I can't really argue with that. Yeah, and characters are wasted, like Zoe Saldana. I thought Zoe Saldana would get back up and have seen something important. Dennis Quaid either looks shocked or confused. Compared to Dread, which has excellent action, the action here is poorly directed. The reveal that Matthew Fox is actually a bad guy is very effective because he doesn't have enough. See, I hugely disagree with that. But yeah, fair enough. You know, he didn't have enough screen time earlier in the film to establish who he is. The whole thing is very messy. Needed one more time. They need more time planning. Let's see, film in Spain. I guess the concept better. Again, you know, good video. I subscribed to them based on it. And I, I believe this was the video where one of them referenced a 2007 thing from Lost and accidentally said that it was from 2017. Boy, he must live in the worst timeline. Considering how bad Lost was by 2010, 
imagine another seven seasons. Holy crap. And then there was, yeah, Vantage Point Spill Review. Also funny, sub to them based on the review. And, yeah, so, the DVD special features. I listened through the commentary track, but everything that I had to say about it, I put in the review and elsewhere in my notes. And, actually, yeah, I, I same thing for the other special features, but, yeah, you know, the, like I said in the review, the, the DVD is, I, I would say, if you can find it on sale, it's, it's just barely worth buying, rather than just, I mean, I, I, I don't know, but I could imagine it's probably also on some streaming services. So, critic sites and the and Wikipedia, and I'm just going to scroll through and see if there are ones that I want to comment on, although I have been going for a while. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna make this quick. So let's see. Streaming Coming still searching. Oops, there we go. Okay, so yeah, so I'm the the four tang lines are eight strangers, eight points of view, one truth. If you think you've seen it all, look again. Can you solve the puzzle? On February twenty second, can you solve the puzzle? And yeah, so the, yeah, yeah, the, the thing about, you know, Secret Service do not chase suspects in an assassination attempt or take the lead in the investigation, that's, that's listed as a plot hole in, on IMDb, and yeah, that's, let's see. Now, yeah, they're, they're simply, I've, I've put everything that I really badly wanted to say in the other notes, so that, you know, I, th I think I'm just briefly going to hold up the, the, the cover, because it is, it is a pretty cool looking, so let's see, I'm going to try to catch the light, yeah, pretty cool. And yeah, I hoped I <laughs> almost got there. Try again. I hope that this review was very revealing from your vantage point. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.